I must begin by saying that being here near Black Mountain College these three days and the thought tomorrow of going on the tour is an important wish come true for me. I had a wonderful, I went to a wonderful, very progressive school in New York called Dalton School. Even by 1939, in the sixth grade, when things began to have meaning at this level, and we were excited, we had already beginning to hear about this exciting place called Black Mountain College. It had an almost mythic importance to us. So, in 1948, now a sophomore in another exciting educational environment, Bennington College, one of the first in the country to grant a degree in dance. When my father told me that he was going to Black Mountain to teach, I think I was more excited than he was. <laughs> and when he asked me to join him, I was overwhelmed, but with very, very mixed emotions because I had to tell him that one of my wonderful Bennington mentors had found me a teaching job in an important performing arts center, Perry Mansfield, in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, so I couldn't join him. A relevant question before we start is, how had it been that I found myself in two of the cutting edge educational programs in the United States. My father knew that great education was at the core of one's complete evolvement, but it must be based on direct experience, the kind of experience that he had had as a boy summering on an island off the coast of Maine where everything required direct action from hauling and carrying the water from the well to the two miles row to and from the mail. Yet, it was something that he hadn't found at Harvard. In fact, he was dismissed from Harvard twice. After his first dismissal, he was sent to work as an apprentice millwright at a cotton mill in Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. He loved it. It was tangible as well as physical work. He was transformed by the experiencing. He was accepted back again in Harvard, but he had learned too much from Sherbrooke. Once back in Harvard, he felt that all he was asked to do was memorize, not validate through experience. He rebelled, and again he was dismissed. He wanted learning by doing, and later he wanted it for me. And he made it happen. Somehow, even though he had no money, and these were expensive educational programs. Just really how this happened, I still don't quite know. Education. It was at the core of Bucky's thinking. But I don't think it really became clear to him what all the elements of this were until his experience here at Black Mountain in 1948. When I, ask, when I am asked what I consider the most important thing about my father, my reply is, Bucky was a great teacher. This to me is the most important thing about my father. And he clearly began to discover it for himself here at Black Mountain. Black Mountain had particular and important elements that led him to this discovery. But what were they? Shortly before her death at the age of 90 in 2006, I spent a wonderful afternoon on Martha's Vineyard talking with Barbara Dreyer. Here are some notes I made from that talk. Barbara Dreyer's 
husband Ted, was one of the founding members of the college. He was one of a small group of faculty who had left Rollins College in 1933 to found Black Mountain, and the Dryers stayed at Black Mountain until 1949. The original group included Ted Dryer and John Rice, who Barbie said had a gift for getting people to think about things. Interestingly, these are all his, her words. Barbie continued, we took 52 people out of Hitler's clutches. We didn't seek people they heard about us. The first were Joseph and Annie Albers, who joined us in November 1933. There were various people, like one of the Rock Mrs. Rockefellers, who were interested in us, and he, she helped us getting $500 for their ticket. When the Albers came, he got off the train, and we took him up the valley to this big white steps that you came up, to this big white building, and a student said, what do you think you're going to do here, Mr. Albers? And Albers looked at him and smiled and said, make open the eyes. And that's what he did. Just to see what you're looking at, not what you're thinking. Barbie continues, they were our best friends, the Albers. I mean, we really learned a lot from them. We began by emphasizing the arts and put them in the center of the curriculum because we th thought that woke people up. And so we got musicians and we got visual people. She continued, and we all talked and ate and talked and ate and danced and sang and studied and learned. Instead of being lectured at, taking notes, giving them all back and being given a degree. You noticed what you were looking at. You tried to think a different kind of way. And it was pretty exciting to notice how you could look at things differently. Faculty could and would attend each other's classes. And Barbara continued. It was pretty nice to have Albert Einstein come down for a weekend, stay a week, then send his two best associates from Princeton to teach. He was at that time advocating something that wasn't the general idea of anybody else that had ever taught physics or math or anything. He was a pioneer and he thought we at Black Mountain stood a good chance of making people think about things they hadn't been taught. As I lost, listened to Barbara, I was excited to learn that John Dewey, father of progressive education, whose philosophy was learning by doing, also came to experience what was going on. As she told all this to me, I realized more clearly than ever before why Daddy had been so affected by his time here at Black Mountain. There was something about Black Mountain that added or clarified critical elements to his own thinking and understanding. Earlier in his life, he had been surrounded by artists that he initially met at Romney Marie's in Greenwich Village particularly his friend Isamu Noguchi and others largely through and with Isamu. Here in Black Mountain, he was in process himself while in dialogue and true interface with a group of artists, all discovering who they were and how to articulate and communicate this others. Joseph and Annie Albers, Bill and Elaine de Kooning, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, and students like Ruth Asawa and Ken Snelson. This dialogue and interface was a true turning point in his life. Bucky discovered 
the only ones who don't get trained for specialization or artists. They want to be whole. It is the artists who keep the integrity of childhood alive until we reach the bridge between the arts and sciences. Artists frequently conceive of a pattern in their imagination before the scientists find it in nature. At Black Mountain, he was not only surrounded by, but in complete interaction with all of this process. He realized that the artist is the gradual discoverer, discoverer of the function in universe for which humanity has been designed to fulfill. He discovered really great artists are scientists, and really great scientists are artists, and both are inventors. All human beings are born artists, scientists, inventors, but that life progressively squelches the individual's drive and capacity. As a consequence, by the time most humans mature, they have lost one or two or three of those fundamental self-starters. He regarded both Henry Ford and Albert Einstein as great artists. He said Ford was a great conceiver. His logistics were like conducting a great orchestra. And Einstein, in his daring concept of universal e evolution as constant action, was engaged in one of the extraordinary moments of purely poetical lucidity of man. We have the greatest conceptioning and the greatest communication by a human being to any other human being. And soon Bucky Cant became to, came to experience that teaching is a creative process multiplied. Teacher and students equally engaged in process, experiencing together, building on each other's discoveries and experiences. As, as Donald Robinson says in his, in his important book, The Mind's Eye of Buckminster Fuller, noting that at first Bucky's students knew only that they understood and not how. It is the relationship between the mind, which Bucky has often talk about, talked about, and experience or experiencing that I found to be a key which unlocks his work. I believe inherently Bucky's concept of mind has at its base mind processing through experience. A vivid image I hold of my father are his fingertips. I can see him sitting with his eyes closed at the beginning of a talk as he was about to both teach and learn from perhaps a thousand people over three or four or five hours, maybe more. And sometimes as he began this finger tapping, it would go on for what seemed like many minutes. And at first it made people quite puzzled and then troubled but he was searching deeply into his mind experience because this led him into his thinking out loud. That was how he identified these talks, which he never anticipated before that very moment of starting. At that moment, with his fingertips barely tapping together, his fingertips were his antennas to experience. His fingertips were exploring the universe around him. No idea that he processed in his mind was ever processed without that link.
to experience. I'm going to repeat that again. No mind, he, no idea he ever processed in his mind was ever processed without that link to experience, direct experience. The largest, the largest concepts, his general, generalized principles, were a summation and culmination of what he called special case experiences. With his fingertips, he was tuning into, in touch with these special case experiences. Said Bucky, the human brain apprehends and stores each sense reported bit of information regarding each special case experience. Only special case experiences are recallable from the memory bank. At the heart of each action was the sense of the special case that would lead to a generalized principle. Any experience, a special case, would become the doorway to a larger comprehensivity. When you were around him, you were aware how sensitive he was to the smallest experience. His focus would zero in on a pebble on the beach, its structure and form, the how and why, its pattern integrity, each becoming a stepping stone to the larger whole. Intuitively, he reviews the broadest possible range of relative experience in quest of universal truth. The truth of the whole, he finds, is in direct contradiction to present specialization. All educational processes must commence at the most comprehensive level of mental preoccupation. That level is one that consists of the earnest attempt to embrace the whole eternally regenerative phenomena scenario universe. Bucky pointed out that the aesthetics of the now world is integrity. And intuition, imagination are all tools of the artist and all relate to and are a part of experience. Bucky continues, aesthetics and intuition are the same, but aesthetics is the subjective and intuition is the objective phase of the conscious subconscious, the threshold crossing communication system. Intuition is practically physical it is the kind of super sensitivity that a child has. He loved children. He loved communicating with children. He had a marvelous directness with no element of compromise as he listened to, talked with, but never at or around a child. In those moments, he was sharing the integrity of childhood. And it was from Black Mountain that he first experienced to the fullest that it was the artist who keeps the integrity of the child alive until we lead, leading us to the bridge between the arts and sciences. Bucky, it is because 99 and 9 tenths percent of the new electromagnetic spectrum reality is invisible to humans that the discovery in the laboratory is essentially aesthetic. The motivation is really a desire to create beauty. Reality is invisible to human beings, but the visible aesthetic gives way to the sense of design integrity of universe. Apprehended, a word Bucky used a great deal, suggested the fingertip experience. Remember, Bucky said, questions are, must only be answered in terms of experience. Hearsaids, beliefs, axioms, superstitions, guesses, opinions, 
were and are all excluded, excluded as answer resources. Bucky didn't use the word feeling often, but he quotes this wonderful E.E. E. Cummings thought at the beginning of his book, Critical Path. I believe what Cummings meant by feel and feeling Bucky understood as relating to experience, experience and experiencing. And I have taken the great liberty of introducing that word into this quote. I quote E.E. E. Cummings. A lot of people think and believe and know they feel experience. But that is thinking or believing or knowing, not feeling, experiencing. Almost anybody can learn to think or believe or know, but not a single human being can be taught to feel, experience. Why? Because whenever you think or you believe or know, you are a lot of other people. But the moment you feel, experience, you are nobody else but yourself. To be nobody else but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everyone else means to fight the hardest battle that any human being can fight and never stop fighting. That was Buck the scenario of Bucky's life to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. And I think he wished that for all of us. To be nobody but your else, nobody else but yourself is at the heart of your, his teaching. And the more Bucky was around others, students, friends, listeners, the stronger they became in their courage to think for themselves their thinking based on their own direct experience. Speaking with an audience, he would say, all I can really give you, I must give you always directly ad identify by experience. One of his great gifts as a speaker was the fact that he helped you experience his ideas. He did this by making you make the connection between your experiences and his experiences. Information is experience. Experience is information. There are only events, not things. Only verbs, not nouns. Black Mountain, let's return for a little bit of context. Chicago architect, Bertrand Goldberg had agreed to teach at the 1948 summer session, but he had to cancel at the last minute and he recommended Bucky as a replacement. Despite Albert's reservations about inviting an unknown person, at the last minute he extended the invitation and Bucky arrived two weeks after the session opened. Only two days later, Albers wrote Goldberg, thanking him for sending Bucky. The, Bucky, the previous evening, had given a three-hour talk, and the college already had found their eyes opening. The project for the summer of 1948 was to be the construction of his first dome, based on energetic, synergetic geometry, and his first disclosure of this ge geometry. When the dome of Venetian blind strips did not rise as predicted, it was Christen, christened the supine dome. But he particularly valued what he learned from that kind of experience. The answer in this case was simple. The Venetian blinds hadn't had enough strength by themselves. And Bucky had worried about this even as he put them in his car to drive down to North Carolina, but that was all he could afford at the moment. The summer of Black Mountain was first Bucky's first 
extended teaching experience. Most of the community sat in on his classes, faculty as well as students. They were fascinated not only by his presentation of his geometry, but also by his vision of a world in which their own experiencing would provide solutions to world problems. It revealed itself to Bucky and to others that he was an exciting teacher because he was challenging himself while challenging his students. They challenged each other. What he further discovered was happening was the, in quotes, progressively coordinated apprehension and comprehension of universe, which he felt the mind spontaneously was prone to deal with. This, he felt, was the essence of education. But a unique experiencing for Bucky this first year at Black Mountain came about because of his own very active involvement in the production of the Rusa Medusa. Something which at first very much puzzled him and he resisted quite vigorously. He said he didn't want to memorize lines and to make, to make a fool of himself. But it was Arthur Penn, then a student, who was directing, and he led Bucky into situations, experiences on campus where he experienced both risk and laughter. Penn demonstrated to him that he couldn't portray the part of another unless he brought his own experience to that portrayal. Bucky later credited Penn with teaching him how to think out loud. But it was how each artist brought their experiences to this experience and the experiencing that they shared that took my father to another level of extent understanding experientially. The Rusa Medusa was a lyric comedy with music by Eric Satie, which John Cade was, was excited about and played on the piano, translated by M.C. Richard, directed, directed by Arthur Penn, designed by Willem de Kooning and Elaine de Kooning and Mary Uten. Bucky was the Baron Medusa, a rich rentier, Frisette, Medusa's daughter, Elaine de Kooning. Jonas, a coarsely mechanical monkey, Merce Cunningham, who danced and choreographed his monkey dances. Special and properties included The Monkey Stand by Albert Lanier, Magnifying Glass and Thermometer, Buckminster Fuller, Bell, Ruth Asawa. Almost everybody was involved in and in multiple ways. The seeds sown at Black Mountain spread. This first summer at Black Mountain was followed with a winter teaching at the Institute of Design in Chicago, where he lived with Warren and Mary Uten, two of the summer's students. Things were turning for Bucky, and three people emerged important at this turning point. Not only Albers, but Laszlo Maholi Nage and Georgi Kepish. Maholi Nage and Albers together had been important in the development of Bar House. Maholi Nage came to Chicago to head the new Bar House, later re renamed the Institute of Design, and still later becoming part of the new Illinois Institute of Technology, while Albers headed to Black Mountain. Georgie Kepish, at first a student and then as an assistant to Maholi Nage, joined him in Chicago to head the light and color department, but moved on to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1946, where he was named Professor of Visual Design, later founding and directing the Center of, Visual, of Advanced Visual Studies and Bucky soon found himself teaching at MIT. But uh, that's really uh, jumping ahead. All this were further de demonstrations of the merging of the arts and sciences, which began to support Bucky's articulation of experience and experiencing. 
at Black Mountain over the 48-49 winter, a crisis culminated in the re resignation of Ted Dreyer, along with the Albers and other members of the art faculty. On the recommendation of Albers, the remaining faculty asked Fuller to return to direct the 1949 summer session. My father accepted and invited, as summer faculty, Chicago friends and colleagues, Emerson and Diana Wolfer, John and Jano Wally, later to join him at SIU, and two Indian dancers, Vashi and Praveena. He also brought a group of students who Black Mountain student designated as his 12 disciples. This group of students were later to form the core of those involving, involved in the further development of geodesic domes. The plan for the summer had, was to continue work on the autonomous dwelling facility with a geodesic structure which Bucky and these students had designed at the Institute of Design the previous winter. Fuller's two summers at Black Mountain were to have far-reaching influence. The friendships formed in the summer of 1948 with John Cage, Merce Cunningham, Ruth Asawa, Ted and Barbara Dreyer, and Joseph Van Annie, Annie Albers were to last a lifetime. When Bucky was really in dialogue and connection with people, it was not only through words, it was intuitive, multilingual, experiencing, experience sharing. In later years, I came to know John Cage and Merce better than others because of my own directions and dance. A film called Thinking Out Loud, a PBS special on Bucky, shows John, and he says, Bucky, and then, then he starts laughing. Bucky wasn't there, or he would have responded in laughter. Laughter was at the core of their friendship. I think their laughter was metaphysical. I'd like to dis digress for just one moment. In 1966, I was on, with my father on my only trip with him. We were on our way to Madrid. Seville on the Costa del Sol, del Sol after many, many months, weeks of traveling. We were sitting in the waiting room of the Barcelona airport. We were in a balcony area which overlooked the very large first floor with its ticket counter. Suddenly there was a sound, okay! <laughs> penetrating across and through the entire length of the Barcelona airport. It was John's voice, much waving, and within a few minutes, John and Merce had run the entire expanse and up the stairs, and they were there with us, laughing, laughing. I'm not sure many words were said. The laughter was enough. And then we were off again in our various directions. Several days later, I was back in the States. Bucky continued on his way to India. I'm not sure where Merce and John were headed but it has remained a moment very hard to forget. But Black Mountain changed the pattern and process of Bucky's life. Among the visitors in the summer of 1948 was James Fitzgibbon, who had taught with, with Henry Kamphofner at the University of Oklahoma. Kamphofner had been invited to head the newly formed School of Architecture presently the School of Design in what is now North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Fitzgibbon was to join him there as a part of Camp Hoffner's program to modernize and revitalize the curriculum. He planned to invite guest lecturers. Jim recommended Bucky and Bucky gave his first lectures in Raleigh in March of 1949 and was there each year after that for the extended period through 1955. In 1954, he received an honorary degree from Raleigh. It was, in fact, the first formal acknowledgement of his work and thinking, and the first 
of some 47 honorary degrees awarded over his lifetime. The faculty offered Bucky technical, technological and design assistance. In 1954, first working, the first working examples of the geodesic dome, pattern granted June 29, 1954, were put to work by the Marine Corps at a base in North Carolina. These domes were later used for the early warning system. Jim Fitzgibbon became a fellow in the Fuller Research Foundation, and in 1955, he started his own firm, Synergetics, in Raleigh, with T.C. Howard and Duncan Stewart, important parts of this group. They were responsible for the execution of detailed designing for the Union tank car domes and the Climatron drone in St. Louis. For most of the rest of my, my father's life, Bucky taught at many, many hundreds of campuses around the country, around the world, but it had all started at Black Mountain. And North Carolina became a part of all of our lives. In 1954, my husband and I, with our very young daughter, Alexandra, moved to Chapel Hill. My husband, Robert Snyder, was a part of the founding of WUNC with hopes of integrating programming that made some emphasis on the artists and their arts. This didn't happen quite that way, and we moved on but not before our son, Jamie, was born in Durham, a Tarly, Tar Heel. He was, among many things, co-founder of the Buckminster Fuller Institute and con continues to serve today as co ex, ex, ex something or other <laughs> of the estate of Buckminster Fuller. Uh, the, the, during this time, we developed a special friendship with John Ely, who was then on the Chapel Hill faculty, later an important part of Governor Terry Sanford's staff, particularly involved in the development of the North Carolina School of the Arts, and himself a writer of many works about North Carolina, both fiction and nonfiction. For me, North Carolina and the power and importance of the artist in his creatively experiencing process are critically entwined, and they are a crit critical part of the Bucky you know. And now, the president of the board of directors of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, David McConville, and Mark Half and Monty Muller, develops, developers of a board spaceship Earth global educational project are all North Carolina residents and important contributors, as you, I know you've already found, to this concert, conference. It is exciting that North Carolina's presence keeps renewing itself, and now here I am having my first direct experience of Black Mountain. North Carolina, Black Mountain, where Bucky truly experienced that the only ones who don't get trained for specialization are artists. The artist, the gradual discoverer of the function in universe for which humanity has been designed to fulfill. The artist who keep the integrity of childhood alive until we reach the bridge between the arts and sciences. I hope we're getting really ready to cross that bridge. It is a critical path we're on, all of us, all of us sitting in here and the whole world. To be nobody else but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means the hardest fight, fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. I can't see any of you.
love you.